And the woman that's going to come up here and speak to you in a few minutes, uh, restored with her husband Francis, largely, I, I mean substantially to the church, something that had been terribly lost. I mean, if you think on it, really from the time of Jesus, uh, the ministry of healing had really kind of gone subterranean in the church. But what happened was there was a woman that was born in uh, Jackson, Kentucky. And that's okay. <laughs> and, and, and this woman had a mom that she used to spend time watching. And her mother had a, a Holy Spirit attraction about her. And people would come over and ask her mom to pray. And Judith McNutt had the opportunity to watch as her mom prayed with others. And she saw the amazing effect that the miracles of Jesus Christ touching a life had. And she carried that with her and decided, with God's help, that she wanted to help people in the same way. And so she did what anybody would do that wants to help people. She became a clinical psychologist. But that's okay. And Judith's practice has suffered from one small setback. And that was that not everybody, as she was working in Boston, was being helped. Good as she is, smart as she is, and from Kentucky, yet not enough. And so she cried out to the Lord, being a faithful person, and said, Lord, why are these people not being helped? And the Lord said to Judith, send them to me, bring them to me. And it was from that time that Judith understood that I think that her ministry was going to head in another direction. And she found herself attached to some Baptists. And that's not bad. <laughs> and with the Baptists, she found herself in Jerusalem in the early 70s. I think in 1974, you must have gone there. She was there for a few years. And she was praying with both Muslims and Jews, Arabs and Jews. And, and she found herself um, watching people who had very similar uh, life needs. And these people were being healed remarkably. And it was in Jerusalem that she met her incredible husband, Francis. And though they did not know at that moment that they would be Mr. and Dr. and Mrs. and they are now. <laughs> they arrived in Clearwater, Florida, and in, um, in, in around 1980 began uh, the Christian Healing Ministries, which is um, a word that, uh, at least an organization that most of us know. Um, I had the opportunity to share um, a little bit this morning, and, and just to let you know, Judith, and the rest of you, that um, sometimes we do things that are huge, and we imagine that we're having a good effect, but, uh, but in your life, Judith, you need to know that there is a room full of people here whose lives have been changed by the work that you and Francis have done. The fact that the Lord has given to you the task of raising up and resurrecting this ministry in the Catholic and the Protestant churches cannot be overstated. In the earliest part of your ministry, you came to St. Luke's Church in Akron, Ohio, and I had the opportunity with Chuck Irish and some others there to sit under you and uh, Francis, and I had just received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And the ministry that you offered to us on that day changed my life forever. In that, I began to understand, and church planters, please take note, that the Lord does miracles. That Jesus came into the world, and in front of him were signs and wonders and miracles. And the planting that he did was always preceded by this ministry. I beg you, pay close attention to what you are going to hear today. Judith has a special gift from the Lord. She will share that gift for all who will be open to receive it today. Judith, it is a great pleasure to thank you and to introduce you to this wonderful Anglican Mission family again. Good morning. I felt like keeping you up here. You're very good. <laughs> I don't know how you knew all that. Website. Website. Oh, okay. Well, it's a joy to be with you 
here in Dallas, Texas at this wonderful conference. And we've been so blessed to be here. Uh, I'd like to introduce Linda Strickland, who is my assistant here on the front row. Some of you know her. She is married to Jean Strickland, Reverend Jean Strickland, over on this side. So we get a package when we bring them. And he's here as one of yours. And Mrs. Cheryl Williams, if you would welcome her. She's here as part of our team. She's the director of our prayer ministry program at Jacksonville, Florida, at Christian Healing Ministries, where we run schools and training to equip people just like yourselves. But we are delighted to be here. We're excited with what's going on here. I've been to every meeting except this morning, and I have felt the energy of the Holy Spirit and the passion and the power and the presence. And I've been renewed just being a part of this, as I see each and every one of you have been. And last night, I had the wonderful opportunity, Linda and I and Cheryl, to go over and pray for all the young people. And that was uh, my greatest joy to be able to minister to them. And I think this group is on the cutting prophetic edge because you're drawing the young people and you're anointing and equipping them to carry this word to this generation that's out there right now. So I want to thank you for that and continue that. That is something we have ignored in the past in the church. And this is something that this group has wrapped their heart around. And it's exciting, isn't it? So encourage, grab every young person you can today and encourage them. That's what we're trying to do at Christian Healing Ministries. Well, what I would like to talk with you about this morning is a subject that I feel is very important to the heart of God. And I think each and every person sitting in this room needs healing in this area. And I believe it from my entire being that the Holy Spirit is speaking this word to you today. Last year, was it last year we were in Dallas? Two years ago. And Bishop Jekko, Stephen Jekko, was part of our audience. And his lovely wife, Joan. And Steve went to be with the Lord this last year. But I gave this same presentation when Bishop Jekko was present. And he came up afterwards and he said, In all the years of my priesthood and being a bishop, I have never heard anyone address this subject. And he said, it has changed my life and my ministry. And I've had healing. What we will be talking about today, which is in your program, is healing our image of God. I, ble I believe in my heart it's just a critical message for the entire church, not just this group. As I woke up this morning, I called my husband and we prayed together on the phone. And he said to extend his love and his blessings and his prayers to each and every one of you. And I've been so blessed in the three days I've been here to have people come up and say, your husband prayed for me 30 years ago and I was healed. Or I read your husband's book and my healing ministry started out of that book. And so he is just very much with us in prayers and in spirit. And I want you to know that. He, he loves this group too. But the thoughts that I had in waking this morning, and I'm going to share those with you in starting, and they gave me permission to move around. I'm not a very stationary person, so they wired me to move. I get very uh, expressive, get excited. Several years ago, our daughter, who's now 26 years old, she was three years old, and we were giving a conference, and one of the unique things about the McNutt Troop, we used to call it, is we traveled as a family. We never left our children. We always took them with us. And I see people uh, with young children on planes now, and I can really appreciate what we did. You know, because, you know, we had to have the toys and the clothes and the food and all that. Every time they'd get bored, I'd pull something else out, you know. But we were doing this conference and it was at a very large, beautiful facility. It was a Roman Catholic facility, and it had a very beautiful chapel, and people kept telling us about the chapel. And so we went in, Francis and I, and David started actually walking that weekend, so it was an exciting weekend for all of us. He was one year old. 
And we were in this beautiful chapel, just the four of us. I had David in my arms, and Rachel disappeared. And it wasn't like you had to panic because it wasn't a big cathedral. And so we went looking towards the front of the church, and there was this altar there. And she had seated herself under the altar. And she was sitting there, and just as we approached the altar, she stood up, you know, she's this big, and she got on her tiptoes, she hooked her chin as far as she could and put her fingers on the altar, and she said in the loudest voice I had heard up into that moment, from the altar, God says hello. <laughs> we said, that's a good sermon. <laughs> That is exactly what God does. And every time we stand up and we proclaim Jesus Christ is Lord, every time we stand in front of you, what we're saying is God loves you. God cherishes you. Your name is written on his heart. He tries every way possible to get that message through to us. He screams that message all the time in the silence of our being. And because we have all of these distorted images of God within us, we can't hear his voice sometimes, can we? And we're so busy, and you're really busy now in church planning, but we're so busy with the work of the kingdom that we oftentimes miss that still, small voice within us that woos us and draws us and calls us into his heart, into that sacred place, into that place of intimacy. And this morning when I was praying, Lord, what do you want to share with these people, these children of yours? He said, bring them into my heart. Bring them into my heart. They need to be settled and deeply rooted in my heart. And they need to hear, I love them. They need to hear that. No matter what the age, no matter whether we have no hair or whether we're just growing hair, <laughs> some of the beautiful babies I've seen here, or if we're on the other side and the hair is slowly disappearing. <laughs> We need to hear this over and over. And it's the message of this man, God, Jesus, too, to each and every one of us, isn't it? Several years ago, and you mentioned that I was in Jerusalem, when I moved there, I had already received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and I might share that little experience with you later. Uh, I was what Brennan Manning said, I was ambushed by God. <laughs> Whoever said God is a gentleman, I just don't think they know him very well. <laughs> he just kind of grabs you and turns you on your head and shakes you, you know. And I'll share that little story with you later. But most of the places I lived uh, was, you know, kind of borrowed places because we went there without the funding of any church. I was working as a clinical psychologist up in Boston, and my patients were getting healed through prayer, and I said to the Lord half-heartedly, where do you want me to go? And he said, Jerusalem. And I said, where is that? <laughs> now, I'm from Kentucky. Where is that? <laughs> it's outside my boundary. And he said, you'll find it. Just sell everything and go. But I got there and I started working. I ran a house of prayer and reconciliation in the Mendelbaum Gate area, very near the Garden Tomb on Nablus Road. It was owned by the Southern Baptist, and they turned it over to me. And we just had one of the wildest rides. I, I wish I had time to just share all of that, because that's where God really showed up in an extremely wonderful way and just began to show me his power and his love and his authority in this world. And it tran just transformed my entire life and my future. And then, of course, I met my husband there, which was another huge step in transformation. But I was living in a borrowed apartment of uh, a friend of mine that was a Messianic Jew, and he'd gone back to America. 
for a visit, and he had a lovely apartment on the west side, the Jewish side, and I'd done most of my living over on the, in the old city. And every evening, I love to pray around sunset. That's the time I like to kind of quiet myself and, and go out and pray. And he had a balcony, and I was on, in an apartment building, and I was out on the balcony, and I was seated there, and I was looking out, and at that time of day, Every evening, the buses would pull up, the public buses. And it was mostly, it was in an orthodox area, so it was mostly men getting off the buses. And as they got off the buses, the women, their wives were standing there, and the little children were with them. And every evening, the children, one or two of them would break away from their parents, and they, from the mother, and they would go running to their fathers and they had their arms lifted up to be picked up and they cried out Abba Abba and every day I would hear that and of course Abba is the Aramaic word that Jesus used for our father and it means daddy it doesn't mean father it means daddy and every day I would watch this and I would see this beautiful act enacted over and over every evening. And then one day while I was sitting there, God used that as an opportunity in my life to visit me. And he came to me in that still small voice. And without judgment, without condemnation, he whispered to me and he said, why can't you come to me like that? And I realized deep within me there was something that was not right. I was there, I was serving him, I was doing all the work that I felt I should be doing. I had left my, my career to go and be a witness in the Middle East to, to his love. And I believed so much in Jesus Christ. I believed in the cross of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. I believed in forgiveness of sins. I preached that every day in this house of reconciliation. But then he came to me and said, there's something missing. And I said, what is it, Lord? And he, he took me back. And we all need this journey. He took me back to the places in my life that were broken. And he started to let them just come up. And I've been on this journey now since 1974 of being healed and restored in my relationship with him and the greatest witness the greatest evangelical tool the greatest words that are ever spoken or witness that's ever given is when someone looks at you what do they see do they see him do they see his light shining out of you? Or do they see, like so many Christians that I've worked with as a therapist for 30 plus years now, a brokenness, a fear, an unknowing? And as I've begun to explore this with people, not only in my private practice, but then working in the healing ministry and traveling, I've been struck over and over again by how many of us carry this distorted image of God within us. And it works against us in several ways. And of course, the first one is it never allows our transformation unless we're healed. And it never allows us to really be effective in our ministry because people see that we're not there yet. You know, in our community in Jacksonville, Florida, which is in the Bible Belt, which is largely Christian, everywhere I go, no matter whether it's in a grocery store or where, I run into Christians all the time. It's nothing like living in Boston, in the Northeast, which is a tougher ground, isn't it? But you know, the South was, I found out, just as tough, because many of those people profess Jesus Christ, and, and they genuinely love him, but they've never allowed him to love them. And this is what he wants to do, and this is what he, how he wants to heal us. 
I'm going to be going over some ways that I feel really what happened to us. How did we get to this place? And I'm going to be talking to you about some of the different distorted images and where they started. But I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to Jeremiah 31:31. 31, 31. St. Thomas Aquinas, who was one of the leading theologians and church fathers in the Roman Catholic Church, who wrote volumes and volumes of theology for the church, made this statement. He said that Jeremiah 31, 31 is exactly what the Lord wants to do in the New Testament covenant. Differing from the Old Testament covenant, where we had laws written on stone, Jeremiah says, if we go, let's go down to 33, Jeremiah 31, 33. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. You see the difference? I will put it in their mind and I will write it in their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. See, that's the promise of the new covenant of Jesus Christ. The law is written in our heart. The word is written in our heart. And the word is written in our minds. And we know him. And that knowing, that is the most intimate word that could, Jeremiah could have used. That knowing. And when I work with people or when I pray with them for inner healing or if they're in psychotherapy or counseling or whatever, this is what we're going for. This knowing of him. I want to know him. You know, St. Paul said towards the end of his ministry, we have to keep that in mind, he said that I may know him. Now, how many of you have been struck down, blinded, and had someone pray over you? Very few of us, as St. Paul, you would think that would make him know the living God. Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. Yet toward the end of his life, he said that I may know him as my heart's cry. And I watched this group last night. That was so beautiful. When the bishop was leading that prayer, and he said, just hold up your hands if you want the Holy Spirit. And of course, the way to know him is through the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, that is the way we know him. But we have as our model, if we read Hebrews 1, read that sometime today, and in, in, in Colossians, talks about Jesus being the exact representation of the Father. And you know, people are very honest with me usually when I'm talking with them. They're, they're very honest, and especially people on airplanes that think they'll never see me again, and they know I'm a therapist. <laughs> they're very, very honest. And they'll start telling me all their problems, and they'll say, you know, I know all about God because I'm a Christian. I can quote you scripture. I can tell you the church laws and the church rules and all that. But I don't know him. And I want to know him. And in that deepest place, I think each and every one of you, especially last night, you were saying, I want to know you, Lord. I want to know you. I want to come into that sacred place. You know, it's interesting. Uh, Francis and I travel all over the world and been to Scotland and England and Rome and so many different places to, to preach, Germany and Holland and all over, Africa. And if you look, especially in, in Europe, at the architecture of the church, have you ever looked at that where way, way back in the back, you know, is the altar and the choir is back there and as, as you keep coming out, that's where the people get to be. Every time we speak in Europe, I, I get some good strong men to get the podium and drag it down to where the people are because I, I like to have contact with the people. But do you see, by the very architecture, 
there's a separation of God from the people. You see that, don't you? And in, in Jerusalem, they have a model of what Jerusalem looked like during the time of Jesus. And of course, it was even worse then because you had within that the Holy of Holies. Then outside of that, you had where the men and the priests were allowed to be. Then it moved on out to where you had the Gentiles and the women were way far away, which is another need for healing in the church, isn't it? And it just kept getting further and further and further away. And what impresses me so deeply is when Jesus Christ died on the cross, and you can read this in the New Testament, when he died on the cross, the veil that came between the Holy of Holies and the people was ripped in half from the top to the bottom by unseen hands. Now, who ripped that? And do you know that was 18-inch mesh, that curtain? It wasn't cotton or gauze. It was 18-inch thick. And when Jesus Christ died on the cross, unseen hands ripped that open. And what is that message to us? You have access to the heart of the Father. You have access to the Holy of Holies. There's no longer courts to keep us apart. There's no longer a distance between us and the heart of God. And we, just, we have complete access to his heart. I've often said another point about Jesus that I love so much that helps me. That he called God. And to this day, if you go down in Meisharim in Jerusalem or an Orthodox area with Jews, they will not say the name of God. They have ways of going all around it, and they have ways of not writing it. And, you know, one of the, one of the first nails into the cross for Jesus Christ was that he dared to call God Abba. He dared to call him Daddy. That was one of the first nails. The healings were the second nails, especially on the Sabbath. Jesus died so that we can call our Heavenly Father, Abba. Did you know that? Do you know in every prayer book, I know you're rewriting your prayer book, in every prayer book, it's Father. In the King James translation, it's Father. Go to a dictionary sometime and look up Father. And then look up Daddy. Daddy. Father is a formal title for a patriarch, an earthly dad. It's formal. Daddy is intimate. Daddy is my dad. That's my dad, Daddy. We had a young man in Jerusalem that came to a prayer meeting one night, beautiful young man. He was Canadian. He came into the service. We had an ecumenical gathering every Thursday night. This young man had just received the Lord Jesus Christ. He was probably 21 or 2 years old. He had that shine on his face. He had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He was one of those you probably should lock up in a barrel somewhere, you know, and feed him through a hole and let him out, you know, after six months, you know, like some of you when you first received the baptism. But he was just radiant, and all of us were there, and we'd been plugging along and, you know, fighting the Antichrist and, you know, going through everything. And this young man stood up during the worship and during the praise, and he lifted his arms, and he started saying, Abba, Abba, Abba. And he said it over and over and over and over, tears running down his face of joy. It was the most beautiful image I've ever seen in my life. The elders of our meeting took him aside after the meeting and told him, you can't do that. You have to call God Father. Pastor Bob Lindsay, Southern Baptist, that was my pastor, took the elders aside. 
He's a Greek and Hebrew scholar who's spent his entire life with Dr. Flusser working on the New Testament, Gospel of Mark, translating it. And I've never seen him. I lived in his home. He was one of my dearest friends, he and his wife. I've never seen him that angry. And he said to the elders, show me in the New Testament where it says that. And you may say, why is she laboring that point? Because it says everything about our intimacy. Not that you should never use the name Father. I'm not saying that. What Jesus died for was to allow us to use that name and that relationship of Abba. What is your image of him? You must ask yourself that. What is your image of him? For years and years, I could tell people everything they wanted to hear. And I've traveled probably in 50 countries now and most of the nations. But until I made that 18-inch journey from my head to my heart, I couldn't, I couldn't seriously reach anyone with the gospel of Jesus Christ, have it bear fruit and have a lasting effect. That 18-inch journey, it's not knowledge, it's knowing. It's intimacy. And it's no matter what we go through in life, and I know some of you have been through much suffering, that relationship is what carries us, that relationship of Abba. C.S. Lewis said, I don't want my image of God. I want his image. And he said that Jesus Christ was always one of the marks of Jesus. He was always shattering people's images of God. He was always challenging people. You know, come closer, let go of that. And what I see when I work in churches, and this is across the board, all denominations, is people sitting in the pews, and the effect, the effect I get, and this is what the Holy Spirit has confirmed over and over, they come with their archaic images, and they come hungry, and they leave hungry. And that's why this fellowship is so exciting, because it's ushering people into not only the baptism of the Holy Spirit and operating in the gifts of the Spirit, but to be able to go as witnesses. You really know him. You're empowered by him. You're equipped by him. So how do these images get started? Let's look at some of these. There's only, I've only listed three. There's numerous ways, of course. But I wanted to leave you. And the first one is exactly what we've been talking about. And of course, what we're talking about is our feltness of God, not our knowledge. That's important to understand that. One of the things A.W. Tozer talked about was our feltness. He said the most important thing in our spiritual journey is our feltness in relation to him. What do we really feel? What do we really know? Not what's in our head. Any of us can quote scripture. So what we're talking about, and this is really true for some of you, it's even on a deeper level than you're aware of. I was telling the group yesterday about, uh, in our workshop about my husband's book. It's a wonderful book. It's his latest. Uh, it was originally published, The Nearly Perfect Crime, How the Christian Church Almost Killed Its Ministry of Healing. And the publisher came to us a year later and changed the title because they said that all the bookstores were putting it in the mystery section. <laughs> and so they changed it to The Healing Reawakening, which is okay, as you said earlier, it's okay. But when he wrote that book, see, I get to write, he's, he's writing two books right now. I get to read all the chapters, you know, as he writes them. And I learned reading that book why I didn't believe in healing most of my life. He takes it all the way back and follows it all the way through. And what I learned reading that, and this is especially crucial, I think, for each and every one of us to understand, is a lot of these wounds are on unconscious levels. And what they're doing is they're operating to keep us 
separated from God. And they're operating on another level to make us feel unworthy. And they're operating on another level not to make us effective. And guess who's the father of that? Satan always. That, that's his trademark. And people will come up. They'll come to Christian healing ministries and they'll come in healing services. And they'll say, would you just please pray for me to know him? They, they don't want a physical healing. They just want to know him. And I'll say, well, why don't you pray? And, they, and it's always sad to hear this. They'll say, maybe God will listen to your prayers. When I pray... I feel like it bounces off the ceiling. Not only do I think he's not hearing me, I can't hear him. That's sad, but that's, that's normal. I want you to hear that, because some of you sitting out here are thinking the same thoughts, and you think you're the only one thinking them. So that's why we want to look at this. We want to uncover and unpack, as we say, these deeper reasons and how we can move into an area where we can cry out, as Romans says, the Spirit of God enables us to cry out, Abba, Daddy, Abba, in our prayers. So let's look at that. The first one is what we're talking about, and I don't mean this against any clergy here. Please don't hear that and say Judith McNutt doesn't like me because that's not true. <laughs> but it's in the area of teaching and preaching. How many of you grew up in a church, just any church? Let me see your hands. All of you need healing, okay? All of you need healing. You really do. You know, we laugh at that. When I moved to Jerusalem, the first prayer that God had me praying in order to get me on my journey was St. Paul's prayer, renew my mind. Lord, renew my mind. Whatever is in there that is not of you, keep what is good and sacred and holy but renew my mind. Give me your thoughts. Give me your laws. Write them in my heart. Now, when we're listening, and I include myself in this, to preaching and teaching, we always have to look at the vessel, don't we? Who's giving that? Who's teaching that message? And what's their experience with the Father? What's been their experience with him? It's a very important question to ask. Listening to Bishop Miller last night, he could have said Mary had a little lamb and I would have been happy and raised my hands for prayer. I would have done anything at that point, you know, because there's a holiness and a love there that comes through that you know he knows him. And I'm going to follow a shepherd that I know knows him. And we all felt that way last night, didn't we? You know, and I watched people. I've been in meetings where very few people would raise their hands to receive the Holy Spirit. You know, and I didn't see anybody in here without their hands out. And it, a lot of it was because of the shepherd that was asking us to do that. You know, he loves and is sold out to Jesus. So what is that? I'm going to look at three things when you're listening to someone. What is that person's experience with God? I've been with some people that... They did more damage to me when I listened to them in relation to God. And a lot of those people I grew up with in the church that I was in. My father was a Cherokee Indian, almost full-blooded. My grandmother was full-blooded, my grandfather half. My father never went to church. He always told me he could find God better in nature. And I came to believe him after a while. But every Sunday, the pastor would stand at the back of the church. And as a little girl, I would walk out with my mother, who believed in healing. I mean, you heard her story. She was amazing. This pastor is at the back of the church. He'd lean down. And I'd put my little hand up. and He'd shake my hand. And he'd say the same thing every Sunday. Where is your father today? And I'd say, well, he's fishing or he's hunting or he's trapping or whatever he was doing out there in the woods. And he said, while he's shaking my hand, you know he's going to hell. Every Sunday I heard that until God gracefully sent him somewhere else <laughs> with the help of the deacons. <laughs> 
and brought somebody else in who said, oh, God loves your dad. He'll come when the time is right. He'll come when the time is right. And you know what happened? My dad got cancer. He called us. We were in California, Francis and I, and he said, please, he's not a Christian now. He said, please pray for me. We prayed. He wasn't healed. He went to the doctor. He had three tumors. Francis said, we've got to fly there. We've got to pray for him. So we flew to Kentucky, went in the room. I told Francis how to direct this time of prayer from California to Kentucky. I said, I know my father. You have to do this, this, and this. We got there. Francis closed his eyes, laid hands on him, and never looked up again. So I started kicking Francis under the table. <laughs> Finally, my father looked up and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to get my husband's attention. Francis didn't even look up then. <laughs> There's just three of us in the room. But I kept saying to Francis, my father needs to be forgiven. See, I knew all of his sins. Finally, Francis looked up and said, Joe, have you confessed your sins? And he said, yes, I have. And he said, then you are forgiven. And I was like, oh, thank you, thank you. You know, five hours later. <laughs> my dad went to the doctor the next day and all three tumors were gone. He was healed that moment <laughs> of cancer. But the deeper healing came in my dad from having Francis lay hands on him. A gentle, strong, loving ambassador for Jesus Christ. And he gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he passed away two years ago, he went to the arms of God joyfully. And I waited my whole life for that blessing. But see, my father grew up in churches like I grew up in. And what worries me is I pray with so many people that have this image of God as an avenging God, as, as a God that waits to punish us. You know, as a young psychologist, I worked with rats. They're all going to be in heaven at the gate saying, don't let her in. Don't let her in. She deprived us of food. She electrocuted us. Don't let her in. <laughs> They're probably going to keep me in purgatory or somewhere for a while. If rats go to heaven, I don't know. We've not, that's a new point. But anyway, I meet people all the time that say, I hope God has forgiven me. Maybe I haven't been punished enough. You know, maybe I need just a little bit more of suffering. You know, what did the bishop say the other night? He is faithful and just to forgive us. So what is that interpretation of Scripture that that person has that you're listening to? And the third question you always want to ask is, I just forgot it. Wait. <laughs> I was so wrapped up in that. Yeah. Their experience with authority figures. Many of us who are in the ministry grew up under parents or under pastors, as I was talking about, or school teachers, or Boy Scout leaders, or whatever. And there's a lot of pain involved in that on a very deep level. And what I'm seeing now in the church for the last 30, 40 years I've been moving around in this is what, what Dallas Willard calls, a lot of the preaching focuses on sin management. Is what Dallas calls it. it. It's an attempt to kind of manage people and control people. And I told the workshop yesterday, I was talking to a Dr. Martin Pommentier, who's a church historian, when I was in his home in Holland many years ago. He lectures all over the world. And Francis and I were asking him, because a lot of people were saying during that time that the charismatic renewal had kind of peaked. And of course, we don't believe that. We believed it's never served its purpose. We've never understood the fullness of it yet. But we asked him about what, what happens to the Holy Spirit. You know, we've talked here about God is doing a new thing. Is it a new thing, or is it something we just as humans haven't grasped yet? 
And we haven't fulfilled the great mission of the Holy Spirit that he's been asking us to do for 2,000 years. And we keep failing in that because we're not hearing what he wants. That's what I always want to know. So we were asking Dr. Pomentier, what happens? He said, following a, every great move of the Holy Spirit historically, legalism sets in. And I told the workshop yesterday, guard against legalism in this group. Because what happens is that kills the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will go somewhere else. So it's not like a new thing. What he's doing is the same thing that we've not worked with him yet. We've not accomplished it yet. D do you get that? It's very important to understand that. Because the Holy Spirit is doing the same thing that the Holy... And I, I'm not trying to dispute anything anybody said. I love what's going on here. And I'm in just wonder of it. But what, what we need to grasp when we're following people under teaching and preaching, what we're talking about, is are they releasing the power of the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do? And are they walking in step with him? And I can tell you, after doing this all these many, many years, I'm still not in step with him as I want to be. I'm still a little nervous about where he asked me to go. And you know what? He will go on to somebody else and get them and throw them in the fray, won't he? And that may be you. That was a nervous laugh, just one person. <laughs> it's a little frightening, isn't it? You want me to do what? That's what I say to him. Francis told me when I came here, by the way, he heard there was 200 people here. And I just want you to know, therapists are comfortable with one person. So, <laughs> okay, so sin management. We want to focus our focus when we're preaching and teaching on love and on mercy. On love and mercy. Mercy encompasses. The Bible tells us, in him, justice and mercy kiss. He is a perfect just judge, but he is the merciful. I love that what he said, when you preach sin and repentance and hell, do it with tears in your eyes. We've got to get this right. We've got to get the message right. If we don't, we're going to lose this generation. I work closely with young people. They're looking for the authentic. They're looking for the real. They're looking for holiness. And they want to be used. They want to be used by God. So preaching and teaching. The second level, and this is the one where, where I, I love to talk about more than anything else. And this is in the area of our family of origin, our parents, the authority figures in our lives, whatever you want to call it, significant people in our lives. This image of God is formed primarily in childhood by authority figures I often tell parents when I work with them that are soon-to-be parents, your children will look to you, and that will be the God that they will know until they reach that place of awareness in their own journey. That's a little awe, isn't it, awe-inspiring to think that. One time Rachel had an experience, and I'll just share this briefly, but... Uh, Francis doesn't like me to share it when he's in the room, so since he's not here, I can tell it. But you know, he's always been the most loving, loving father and husband. He's just an incredible pastor, priest, everything. And when Rachel was a little girl, you know, I've often said, children never get thirsty until it's time to go to bed. You know, and all you parents know that. You know, first, first tactic, I'm thirsty. You know, second one that she pulled on me, that night that I so desperately wanted that five minutes after the last one goes to sleep. She, after we got her the water, the second one was, I'm lonely. She knew that hooked me because I'm a therapist too and a mother. So I thought she'd be scarred for life if I didn't sit down with her, you know. And one of you would be praying in her healing with her someday, you know. Because her mother, Judith McNutt, abandoned her at bedtime, you know. So I sat down with her, and then after half an hour and I wanted to go to bed, you know, I said, Rachel, Jesus is with you. 
That's all you need. I'm going to bed. <laughs> and this altered voice came out, you know. It was like, what was that? I told Frances, I think I need prayer. But she didn't call me again. You know, we'd been through like 10 times. She didn't call me again. So I went back in and peeked on her, as we say. Slowly opened the door. And she was sitting up in bed, smiling and happy and looking over towards the corner. So I said, Rachel, what are you doing? You should be asleep. And she said, I'm talking to Jesus. <laughs> I did tell her he was there. And I said, that's sweet. And then she ignored me and went back to talking to him. And she was looking at a point in the room. So I said, is he in here? Is he here? And she said, well, yeah. She said, you don't seem. I'll never forget that. It's like she had what up on her mother now. I said, of course I do. <laughs> just, just, just get, there's a lot of shadows in here. <laughs> so we kind of went through that. And finally, I said, I don't see him. I said, tell me what he looks like. And she said, well, he's really tall. And he's got really dark hair. And he's got smiley eyes. I love that, smiley eyes. And he's got this beautiful smile, Mom. And he's looking right at me. Not you, you know. <laughs> and then she said, he looks just like Daddy. Princess cries every time I tell that. He's just this tender spirit. But see, I walked out of that room that night knowing my daughter would never need the healing that I needed in relation to my own dad because her dad had loved her in a way and to this day, she has such a beautiful image of God. Not the church, unfortunately, but God. Our earthly parents are hugely significant in the formation of our image of God. Dr. David Siemens talked about this in his books. Hugely important. And if we don't allow ourselves to have the inner healing that is necessary about our earthly parents, and I want to give you a nice little website that you can go to that has a, a study on it that I think would be really helpful for all of you. And you can download the study and go through it. I keep losing things up here. It's not that big a place. Okay, where'd I put them? Who has reading glasses they're not using? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody in the room, I love this. Oh, they're good. They work. <laughs> Last night, David gave me the graduated ones, and I was going like this. <laughs> okay, there you are. Yes. Okay. This is called Re Recovery from Distorted Images of God, Six Studies for Groups or Individuals by Dale and Juanita Ryan. They published it in 1991, and it's at www. See, all the young people can find this, and the rest of you go home and get your children or grandchildren to find it for you. Dot Christian Recovery. I love their title, ChristianRecovery.com. www.ChristianRecovery.com. What they go through a little more deeply than, than I have time to, the different areas how our parents affect us and how those messages are within us. And some of the images they look at is the God of the impossible expectations. And these images are formed within us early on by our parents. And we have, as humans and as children especially, a tremendous need for approval, don't we? Even as adults. This one, remember uh, Pharaoh when he said to the Israelites, the Hebrew children as we call them, build more bricks. Now build bricks without straw. Some people I pray with have that. I can never do enough for God. And I know instantly that's rooted in their childhood. Way back there. Then they talk about the emotionally distant God. 
the God who detaches, and that comes from parents who are not emotionally available to us in our homes as children. And they go through about six. The abusive God is the one that does the most damage. And that is the image of God that forms when we grow up in a household where there's abuse. Incest, sexual abuse, physical abuse, ver verbal abuse, all of those things, neglect, abandonment. When we were at the Toronto church recently, Francis sang in the spirit. It's a beautiful healing experience if you've ever sat under his ministry when he does that. It's just so annoying. I get healed every time. Every time. You know, I just end up on the floor and I'm just totally ineffectual the rest of the night. But this one night, there was two sisters sitting in the audience and one was a Christian and the other one wasn't. And the Christian had invited her non-Christian sister to come to this evening. And both girls had been incested by their father. The Christian girl had been through the inner healing already and was freed of those painful memories. But her daughter, her sister, was just clinically depressed and suffering. And Francis sang in the spirit. And the girl started weeping, sobbing. And her sister leaned over and said, what's going on? And she said, and this is so remarkable, uh, the gift of tongues. She said, the song he's singing is the one that after our father would abuse me, I would go and I would get in the bathtub and run it with hot water and I would sing that melody to myself. And you flash forward 30 years and a man in obedience to God sings a melody that makes him feel foolish doing it. And it healed this girl of a deep, deep wound of incest. Isn't that remarkable how God does these things? Yes, you can thank him, because that was an extraordinary one. The first time Francis and I did a conference together in Holland, I was sitting, I call these the king's chairs, and I was sitting in one of them, and he was speaking, and we were going to sing for, or pray for the whole group for healing. And he sang in the spirit, and you know what happened? God took me back, and this sounds insignificant, but it was so key took me back to a childhood memory where my best friend was a dog. How many of you had a, a dog that was the best friend? Her name was Lady, and Lady would go to the movie theater with me on Saturday morning to watch the westerns and all. And Mr. Crawford, who ran the theater, Lady would sneak in, and she'd jump up in the seat next to me. And all the, girl, all the kids knew her of course, and they'd say, lady, put your ears down, you know. <laughs> we can't see the screen. And lady would go like this, you know, and kind of hunker down. And every time, Mr. Crawford, we do this every Saturday morning, he came down and he said, when I, Judith, you know lady can't be in here. She's a dog. And I would say, well, Mr. Crawford, you make her leave. <laughs> and he would look at lady, and lady would just lift her lips like that. It was like she was trained with Mr. Crawford. It's the only time she ever did it. She'd go like that. He'd say, okay, lady, just this week. <laughs> no. Well, there was a man in her town who hated dogs. I and mean, he put hamburger meat out and put strychnine on it. And lady ate it. And she made it up the front steps onto the porch. Came to me and I couldn't help her. And she died in my arms. I found out he had done it, and I went to the AMP where he always shopped, and I waited for him. I'm not a shy, retiring person, you may have noticed. And I attacked him. I said, you know, you killed my dog. And he said, so what? He wasn't repentant or anything. I lived with that anger and that sorrow for how many, 30 years. And Francis sang in the spirit in Holland. We'd only been married about a month. I melted. I went under the power of the Holy Spirit. I was right back in that little girl's emotions of loss and sorrow and sadness and anger. Francis came over and said, it's time to pray for people. 
they paid your airfare, you know, from America. <laughs> Work. You know, get up. And I said, I can't. And he said, what's wrong? And I said, my dog died. <laughs> he said, I didn't know we had a dog. <laughs> I said, we don't. He said, maybe you better stay there. And God took me back in such a beautiful way to forgive Mr. McDaniels. And I was freed. The Lord knows the places of pain in our hearts. He knows how our parents have wounded or distorted us or caused us to be crippled in certain areas of our lives where we need to be set free. Perhaps they just couldn't love. Or perhaps they were abusive. Perhaps they abandoned. And the Holy Spirit wants to go to those places and set us free. I'm always amazed at his ability to go right to the place where I need him. To go right to the pain. He doesn't mess around with anger. He doesn't mess around with anything else. He goes right to the pain. And, of course, the third area, and this is one where we've all suffered and been disappointed is in the area of death and loss and suffering. It's remarkable how God gets blamed for everything, uh, even with people that don't believe in God. You know, they'll say God did it. Or, you know, we live in Florida, which is slammed by hurricanes. And you know, there's actually a clause in insurance companies, and you've heard this, especially with the big ones, Katrina, that it was, it was an act of God and we blame God for hurricanes. You know, like he's up there going, okay, they look a little bored. You know, let's send them a hurricane or, a, you know, a tornado or a tsunami. It's remarkable the discussion that comes about in the media after something happens like a tsunami, isn't it? It's remarkable. And I'm always amazed at how God gets the blame for it. But in the area of death and loss and suffering... And C.S. Lewis, going back to him again, how many of you have read his little book, A Grief Observed? It's a wonderful little book. But you know, he wrote that book when his wife Joy was dying of cancer. He kept a journal. And when that was first published, he wouldn't allow his name to be put on it. He used a pseudonym. It's now published under his name. But I want to give you a quote that will probably really surprise you and... and you may walk in that place. He said, I am not tempted to disbelieve in God. I know God exists. He said, I am more tempted to believe that God is a sadist. Now, did you know C.S. Lewis said that? He's one of our great, great fathers of the faith. Now, he did work through that, but when he was going through a time of suffering and watching someone that he loved suffer and die, he couldn't find God. How many of you, and I want you to raise your hand on this, have gone through a time where you felt God had abandoned you when you suffered? Now I want you to keep your hand up and look around. That's about 80% of this group. What I want to say to you and what I say to myself over and over again is, we don't understand suffering, do we? We don't understand it. Job, which is one of the last books of, uh, written in the Old Testament, the whole book of Job is about our struggle with death and loss and suffering. And you know, God never answered Job's questions, did he? Another little interesting piece, if you go through the New Testament, Jesus never answered anybody's questions. They would ask him a question. He would use it as a teaching opportunity, but he never answered what they asked him. I love that. I wish I could do that. Just totally ignore what the person said and talk about what you want to talk about. <laughs> Therapists can't do that, you know. Well, forget you. I'm going to talk about myself now, you know. Suffering traditionally, historically in the church has been labeled, and I agree with this completely, as a mystery. 
When I pray with someone who's going through deep suffering, death or loss, the comfort that comes is in through being with them in that suffering and praying for the Holy Spirit to come and give them the wisdom and the revelation they need to go through that suffering and to companion with them in that suffering. But what happens is when we pray with someone who has lost someone that they love, like a child, they have a deep bitterness towards God and an anger. How can you as a Christian say I'm angry with God because he didn't give me the life I wanted? He didn't give me the husband or wife I wanted. He didn't give me the parents I needed. How can we say we're angry with God? Jesus deals very honestly with those emotions. And he comes and he brings healing. A friend of mine who's an Episcopal priest and a wonderful man, he's actually an Orthodox priest now. He left the Episcopal church. I wonder why. But he was having some of those issues, problems that so many are suffering from right now. It's a time of suffering in our churches right now because of all the pain and upheaval that we're going through. But he said, when someone dies, and he used this in relation to a child, but I use it for everyone. He said, don't tell them that God was walking through the Rose Garden of Life and picked their daughter because she was so beautiful. We've all heard that at funerals, haven't we? And you know what? It brings no comfort. None. He said, instead, tell them the truth. Death took your mommy away from you. Jesus loved your mommy so much, he took her away from death. And see, that's the truth, isn't it? O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? Thanks be to Jesus Christ, who is swallowed up in his victory. So, you know, we have to stay always on the side of healing, on the side of truth. We journey with those who suffer. But just because it's in the past doesn't mean it's not going to impact us today. I want to close with a story. We're going to go a few minutes over, but they said that's okay. You should never, you know, put a therapist up here. <laughs> they haven't been trained to let people out for the pot roast or whatever. <laughs> but this happened several years ago, and you can just close your eyes if you want to. You don't need to look at me. You can hear this as a, a parable by Jesus, maybe a modern day. I had a woman that came, brought by her pastor, she was mentally ill. She came to my private practice because he heard that I would pray with people. And the sad thing about this woman, she had been labeled mentally ill. She was institutionalized. He took her out of the institution and brought her for healing. It was a, a pretty, pretty big challenge for me personally because I'd worked in psychiatric hospitals with very disturbed people, and my practice now is working with neurotics like most of us. <laughs> so this was a challenge again, and I started to take her history, and I found out that she couldn't remember anything under the age of eight. She'd been raised in another country. Sometimes when we don't remember our childhood, it means it's too painful to remember. That's not always true. But God built our mind in such a way the unconscious mind will actually absorb that and keep it. But it still affects our behavior is a sad thing. And our perception of ourselves and our world. So as I began to, I, I realized we couldn't find a root cause to pray the inner healing prayer. So I said, on about the third visit, I said, could we just hold hands and ask the Holy Spirit to release a memory that is significant in your healing? And then let's be quiet. This woman had no church background, no scripture background, no nothing. Never been in a church. And what had happened to her, and this was a memory that came back, her father, who was one of those wonderful dads like Francis, was the light of her life. She adored him. He protected her from her mother. Her mother was uh, mentally ill. Her mother was abusive her, verbally and physically. Locker in closets called her names, beat her. Then one day, her mother got her and took her to a little clinic because her father had had a heart attack and he was dying. And she was just a little girl. 
And her mother left her outside on the chair and said, I'm going in to see your dad. I'll come back for you. And when she came out of the room, she picked her up out of the chair, dragged her by the arm, out into the street, down the street. And the little girl, I'll, I'll call her Sue, the whole time going down said, I want to see Daddy, I want to see Daddy, let me go back. And her mother finally picked her up and just shook her and said, you'll never see him again, he's dead. You know, children can't comprehend death till the, the age of eight at least. This girl was too little and she said, what does that mean? And she said, you'll never see him again. And if I see you crying, I'll beat you. And the mother went home and took all the everything out of the house that belonged to the father. Pictures, clothes, everything, and threw them away. So it's like he never existed. So it's like he disappeared. And then many years later, this memory emerges. And she said, I'll never forget this. She said, do you think that's important? <laughs> I was like, yes, that's it, that's it. And I started to lead the prayer of inner healing. And I said, I want you to see yourself sitting back in that chair, because that was the memory that God gave her. Can you see yourself there? And she saw herself. And it was like suddenly when I was looking at her, she became like a little girl. She looked like a little girl. And I could see that little girl sitting in a chair kind of swinging her legs. And I said, now can you see Jesus come into this image? And suddenly her whole face lit up. And she said, I see him. He's coming. And he, this is, Jesus then tapped me on the shoulder and told me to be quiet, which he does sometimes. And he said, I'm going to lead this. And this is what he did. And I believe there's some of you in here that need to hear this. That's why I'm sharing it. And we share it in a real prayerful attitude for your healing too. He came up to her and he said, what are you doing? And she said, I'm waiting to see my dad. And he said, well, why don't you go in and see him? She said, they won't let me. And Jesus gathered her into his arms and carried her into the room. There was her dad with his eyes closed. And she looked at Jesus and she said, is he dead? And Jesus, I want you to follow Jesus' reaction to this. Jesus laughed, said, no, he's asleep. He said, do you want me to wake him up? And she said, oh, yeah. And Jesus reached over and touched the forehead of her dad and he opened his eyes. And Jesus placed Sue in the arms of her father. And they had the most wonderful reunion. And after a while, Jesus said to Sue, you know, Sue, I was wondering, would it be all right with you if your dad goes to live with my dad? And she said, what's he like? I want you to hear the questions and hear the answers. And Jesus laughed again and said, he's just like me. And she loved what she saw in Jesus. And then he said, would it be all right? And then Sue said, where does he live? And Jesus said, it's not far from here. And she said, can I go too? So she wanted out of that pain. Can I go too? And Jesus said, no, but when it's time for you to come and live with us, I'm going to come and get you, just like I've come for your dad. Now will you let him go? And she said she looked into the eyes of Jesus. She saw the pure love there, the joy and the radiance, and she knew her dad would be happy. And she said, okay. And then Jesus said, and this is where I think the healing really came, I want you to say goodbye to him. Because she never got a chance to say goodbye. And she threw her arms around his neck, and she said, Bye-bye, Daddy, I'll see you later. And Jesus gathered her into his arms and took her back out of the room. She got up and left my office that day, and I had to cancel my appointments for the rest of the day. And all I could think about was the goodness of God to reach into a person's pain that far back and bring the truth and the healing love of Jesus Christ. 
And all I could think about with my good Baptist background was John 14. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father, Jesus said. I and the Father are one. I go to prepare a place for you. And when it's time, I'll come again and receive you so that where I am, you may be also. And he said, I am the way. I am the way. Not just to heaven, which is where we've kept that scripture, and not just to salvation, where we tried to place it. But I am the way to the Abba's heart. I'm the way to his heart. That's what Jesus said. I am the truth. And poor Thomas said, just show us the Father. We'll be satisfied. He said, can't you see me? See, the Holy Spirit wants to open our eyes, not only to the path to the Father's heart, but to the healing that's available in each and every one. And I'm going to ask you, as you have your eyes closed, I want you, if, if God is working in you, I want you to just stand where you are. This isn't going to be lengthy. Just stand where you are. If he is touching a memory in you, or if anything in this resonated with you about a need for healing, I want you to stand where you are and put your hand over your heart. Now, the second level of that would be, is if any of you need to release someone and say goodbye to them. It's somebody either living or somebody that's already gone on. And I want you to just put your hand over your heart. And in so doing, and especially in relation to our parents, uh, the word that the Lord gave me this morning, it wasn't even a word. It was a, a weeping before him because of the pain in this group in relation to their parents. And many of you, no matter what your age, you still carry some of these things. So just... Stand where you are if you have any of that. Or if you have that teaching and preaching inside your head that you want God to renew. And we're going to ask him today to do that. And if you're not comfortable standing, that's fine too. Uh, you won't miss the prayer. <laughs> Holy Spirit goes anyway, don't worry. <laughs> so Father God, we just uh, come to you now as our Abba. We come to you with our pain, we come to you with our confusion. We come to you crying out to you to hear the heart's cry. The Holy Spirit is the great paraclete, the one who hears the cries of our hearts. So we ask you to come, Holy Spirit, now with your healing power to each one here that needs that deep healing, Lord, and release within their memories. We ask you to come into their broken hearts, Lord Jesus, you who came to heal the brokenhearted and set the captive free. We ask you to come with your arms of love and just embrace each one here that needs to place all of that in your cross now all of that pain, all of that anger, all of that sense of being abandoned and lost and unsafe. Lord, we bring all of those emotions and all those memories to your cross. And we know that when it says, by your stripes we are healed, we know that that carries our emotional burdens too. So Lord, come now to each one here pour by the power of your Holy Spirit your love into their hearts. Just pray, Lord, that Romans 5.5 5 prayer. Just come, Holy Spirit. Pour your love into the hearts of your children. Come and open the eyes of their hearts to their great worth in you, their value in you. Flood them right now from the top of their head all the way through their body, mind, and spirit with your love, your healing presence. And Lord, we release to you those that we have held on to, especially those early deaths in childhood. We release to you now, Father, to your kingdom, those that we have tried to hold on to 
and we trust you with them. And we ask that you come into that grieving place and begin to heal and to restore. And Lord, we pray for the pain that's in your church, your church, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit, that healing balm of Gilead over your church and bring healing to every wound that is there and bring your restoration. We thank you, Father. We love you, Abba. We give you glory for what you're doing. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. I'd like to take the, the healing teams. I want to dis we're definitely going to dismiss the group now. But if there's anyone that wants to talk to someone, we're going to ask the healing teams to be up here just for a while. It's not a healing service. But if there's any one of you that would like to talk to anyone uh, or have a special prayer if you feel a need to say something, I know sometimes that helps, or to hear something, a word from God, we're just going to ask the teams to be across the front. And the rest of you, if you want to stay in your chair and pray, that's fine. If you want to go to lunch, or be alone, that's, that's fine, and Ellis is going to tell you the rest of it, so thank you.